live from the Lisner Auditorium on the campus of the George Washington University. It's O'Reilly versus Stewart. The rumble in the air-conditioned auditorium. And now, please welcome your moderator for this evening, Edie Hill. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the Rumble in the Air Conditioned Auditorium. I'm going to give you the rules tonight. They are pretty simple. We're going to split the first hour into about five 12 minute segments. And at the start of each segment, I'll ask a question. The gentlemen then have two minutes each to respond. After that, they can take on each other. I can ask follow up questions. The next thing we'll do is go to you, the audience, uh, both here in the auditorium and on the internet. That will be our lightning round, and we will uh, take the questions that you've given us and pose them to the gentleman. Now, the specific topics have been agreed to by both Mr. O'Reilly and Mr. Stewart, but they have not seen the questions. They have not approved the questions. And for those of you watching on the internet, the audience here has been told to please keep their cheering and perhaps their laughter to a minimum. Uh, to be respectful, at least they will try to. Now, it is my privilege to introduce tonight's rumblers. First, you know him from the O'Reilly Factor and is the author of numerous books on the killing of presidents. <laughs> from Levittown, New York, standing a gargantuan six feet four inches tall, Bill O'Reilly. And from The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, the winner of an obnoxious amount of Emmys. He's from somewhere in New Jersey. He is standing a hobbit-like, five foot seven inches tall, <laughs> Mr. Jon Stewart. coin, Mr. O'Reilly decided he goes first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Many, <up> pundits, <laughs> Many pundits, and you know who you are, say that this is the most important election in a generation. Republicans say that voters should ask themselves, are you better off now than you were four years ago? Now, President Obama can point to a declining unemployment rate. Mr. Romney claims that the Obama policies created the most sluggish recovery in history, and if continued, will make it even worse. So, Bill, do you think people will make their choice based on the economy? I don't care. Um, <laughs> first of all, how's the air conditioning in here? Is all right, everybody comfortable? Everybody, if you want it turned up a little, just tell Stuart we'll take care of it, all right? Now, I'm going to have a little three-minute opening, and then he'll mock it, okay? Remember a, a few weeks ago that the tape broke uh, where Governor Romney was saying that 47 percent, 47 percent of Americans are slackers, all right? They're not, they're not cutting it, as Clint Eastwood would say, they're not cutting it, all right? Well, he was off by about 27 percent, about 27. About 20 percent of us are slackers, and it's a growing industry, and that is what the election is all about. That's what the country's facing right now. We are spending an enormous amount of money on 20% who, for whatever reason, ah, we're just not going to cut it. We're not going to make a living. We're not going to really do anything. We want our stuff. And we're spending a lot of money. Debt is bad. Debt is bad. All right? $16 trillion in debt. President Obama, who I like, by the way, and who is dodging me on a one-on-one -on -one basketball game, did you know that? Yeah. Dodging it. I like him. Biggest spending president by far in the history of the United States. In fact, President Obama has spent more money than all of the other presidents combined if you take out World War II, which we had to spend a little money there. Okay? All of them. So Martin Van Buren is going, why? Why? Now, the reason that the president will tell you he's spending a lot of money is because of Bush. 
It's Bush's fault. You, how many people think it's Bush's fault? Bush is gone. <laughs> Adios, sayonara, aloha. It's boring. He's gone. Okay? Out of there. It may have been Bush's fault for the first year, maybe two, but not <laughs> three and a half. Now, and this is the final part of my opening statement, the poster person for the entitlement society is Sandra Block. You know Sandra? I left two tickets for Sandra, plus a month's supply of birth control pills <laughs> at will call. Is she here tonight? No, she's not. Sandra, buy your own <laughs> coupon, right? We shouldn't be paying for this or a lot of other stuff. That's why we owe $16 trillion. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. That's it for me. <laughs> oh. You say, Mr. Stewart. My friend Bill O'Reilly is completely full of shit. <laughs> now, he and I agree this country does face some problems. We do have some issues. What we disagree on is the scope of these issues and the cause of these issues and the timing of these issues. I believe we have very complex problems in this country, like we have had in this country low since its inception. <laughs> what is wrong with this country is not that we face problems that we have not faced before. We face a deficiency in our problem-solving mechanism. And the reason we face a difficulty in our problem-solving mechanism is that a good portion of this country has created an alternate universe <laughs> in, which, in which the issues that we face revolve around a woman from Georgetown who wanted birth control, which is a health issue for women, covered on her health insurance in the same way that Viagra is covered <laughs> for many others. I call this alternate reality, I call this place where these folks live Bullshit Mountain. <laughs> the denizens of Bullshit Mountain believe many things. They believe that a Kenyan Muslim president has fundamentally changed the relationship between government and the people of this country. On Bullshit Mountain, they believe that if they built it, it was because of their success and a little quick moxie and freedom juice. But if life hasn't worked out for them, it is the government on their back. Oh, Bullshit Mountain is a dangerous place. Not to, not to mention the winters on Bullshit Mountain. Oh, <laughs> the winters on Bullshit Mountain are long and cold. And Christmas, the most ubiquitous holiday in the history of mankind, is under threat on Bullshit Mountain. <laughs> Because somewhere, somehow, a parade in Tulsa has changed its name from Christmas to holiday. <laughs> I have come here tonight to plead to the mayor of Bullshit Mountain. <laughs> I know that you don't live on Bullshit Mountain year-round. You, 
Obviously, I have to leave for provisions, and I believe you have a summer place. But <laughs> until we can agree on a reality that exists in this country, you and those denizens believe that we face a cataclysm, a societal cataclysm between freedom and socialism. And on Bullshit Mountain, our problems are amplified and our solutions simplified. And that's why they won't work. We face a debt crisis that we've never faced before. We are merely weeks from being a failed state or even worse, Greece. And the way to solve it is to kill Big Bird. Now, let me say this. That is not a solution. And I believe tonight we will take you down from the mountain. And you can come live amongst the people once again. Thank you. I don't really have to. <laughs> a minute to reply? That's all I really need. One okay. minute. All right. Well, while we're on the subject of BS, why is NPR getting our money? There he is. All right. Why? Now, Mr. Stewart, of course, very eloquent in his uh, use of the imagery that he put forth tonight. Uh, Bullshit. Right. <laughs> Very, very, very eloquent. <laughs> totally dodging every important issue. Everyone. <clears throat> Income redistribution. Yes. Do you believe in it? Do you? No. <laughs> I asked first. Oh, I it's believe, a complicated I one. believe in Social Security. Do you believe in Social Security? Yes, absolutely. So I'm we're both me. socialists. No, no. <laughs> we're both Income. socialists. Redistribution. Social Security is income redistribution. No, it's not. You pay into it. But you don't pay into it what you get out of it. You pay into Some it. Some people pay more. And in a cumulative effect. No, 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 right? no, 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 and then no, you no, get no, no, yep. no. It is a progressive tax. All right. If you earn 125000 you pay more into it than someone who pays 50000 That's. You dodge, your, you dodge your question. Income redistribution, Robin Hood on steroids, okay? Mm -hmm. Cuba, Sherwood Forest, Mao. Now, this is, not, this is not how the Founding Fathers envisioned, envisioned us. All right. I like you much better back then. All right. <laughs> I'll go halfway. So we have a president here who believes in social justice. All right. He wants to take your money, my money, the money of the 1%. All right. And he wants to give it to Bill Moyers. There he is. Bill gets it. I don't want to do it. All right? I so work, I I work hard for my money. Let me ask Here's this. how hard I work. I'm here. OK. <laughs> That's you how hard. You don't want your taxes to go to something that you don't agree with. Is that your no, premise? I want, no, I no, want no, 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 them no. to go. I want my taxes to go right. to people who need help. Now, Bill Moyers needs help. I understand that. But not economically. All right? <laughs> what was that? Thank you. What was that? <laughs> We're moving on I don't questions. Know, oh, I don't know that I have time to unpack this. <laughs> but the reason that we invest in things like public television yes. is that it brings educational programs to communities that would not have them. It's one of the best investments we ever well, made well, as a well, country. Well. Now, second of all, the investment in public television is $130 million, $130 million. And I am sorry that you don't want to spend your hard-earned tax money on that $130 million, but let me say this you to you. Welcome wait, wait, to the wait, wait, fucking wait, wait, club. Wait, wait. Now. Oh, no, no, no. Do you know how many birth control pills here's, $130 here's what I would say. buy? Give, give me my money back, the $800 billion for the Iraq War and children's television is on the house. Give me the money back for the Iraq War and it's rubbers for everybody on me. Excuse me. This notion that we are not a society that when you pay in your taxes, you must agree with every single expenditure that is given is ridiculous. You know what's Here's what's ridiculous. Here's what's ridiculous. $16 trillion dollar debt and we got to pay for Bill Moyers. Let him compete on his own. You want an educational program? Watch your program. Spring for the cable, all right? Let him compete on his own. Well, let me, let me ask right? you this then. Come if, on. If NPR, 16 trillion, you've got to start to <laughs> cut. Right. 
<laughs> okay, we Thanks. have to start to cut. I'm yeah. not sure 130 May million is the way to go. Questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Can we just keep going? <laughs> You're done with your opening But this stages. is, I think, a, a good area to go on because I think it, it to speaks to scale and it speaks to the psychosis of Bullshit Mountain. So let me just <laughs> very let's, quickly get in this. Let's talk about... So Bill O'Reilly has identified <laughs> the $130 million from NPR because NPR should be able to compete on its own. Correct. Let me ask you this. Should Exxon be able to compete on its own because we give to them and other companies like it, the top 250 countries in this country, over $260 billion every year. Yeah. I, I actually agree with you. <coughs> what? I, I, oh. yeah, I don't, I'm not giving <laughs> subsidies to anybody. <laughs> Thank Hill, you. Do you have a question? I, I actually do, yes. Oh, there you <laughs> Should I come down? Let's, let's go with it. Come off the mountain right now. I gotta tell you something. Keep going. I can see why Obama did badly in the debate. The altitude really is rough up here. <laughs> My head is spinning. You, you mentioned earlier that uh, President Obama didn't create the mess. He says, I, I got this. I got this on the first day I walked into it. Mm -hmm. So who do you think, or what do you think, is to blame for where we are economically? Bill, you go ahead. Excellent question. Excellent. What is to blame for where we are economically? Yes. Excellent question. Well, <laughs> may, I, may I borrow one of your cards for this? No. <laughs> Thank you for asking that. Another Small business scared of Obamacare, won't hire, mm. all right? So when the government starts to call the shots in the free marketplace, mm -hmm. and the shots start to make people a little nervous, they say, hey, well, maybe I'm not gonna hire so much. And uh, worse than that, maybe I'll start to let people go. And maybe I won't lend any money like the banks. You guys know that since Obama has been in office. We're allowed to bring notes? Yeah. Since the president has been in office. <laughs> Doesn't it feel much better now? Oh, he's back. $5,000 the average um, worker has lost in pay. That's a lot of dough. And gas prices have more than doubled. All right? So you're paying more for stuff and you're making less. Why are you making less? Because the employers go, you know what? For every job I have open, I got 10 people wanting it. So I'm not gonna pay you very much. I'm bringing the salaries down. It is a mess. So you gotta let the free marketplace kinda run a little bit. Now I understand the greed hits. I understand the Wall Street stuff. I got it, I'm not a big Wall Street guy. But you gotta let them go. You gotta unleash the machine. Yes, could, cause what could go wrong? Oh, like we're doing real great now, huh? We're, we're not doing real great now, but if you take your eye from looking at the world through a toilet paper roll and you get a broader perspective on it, uh -huh. you'll see that the things that you are suggesting are not part of a fundamental change that Obama has brought. And that what, is, what that is exactly point. is that change? Well, let me, let me put it to you this way. So Thanks. when Bush left office, when he took office, he had a $100 billion surplus, right. yes? When he left office, the deficit that he left in one year was right. $1.2 trillion, right? Yeah. Okay. So that is a change from 100 billion of surplus to 1.2 trillion in right. deficit. That's a difference of? Yes. $1.3 trillion. Okay. The president, his first year, there was a deficit of 1.2 trillion. This year, it's 1.2 trillion. So he's had, held the deficit steady. How, how, altogether, how much debt has President Obama run up? S uh, six trillion dollars. Very good. Six trillion dollars. Six yeah, I trillion. Learned, I learned that on Sesame Street. Well, let me ask you this. Yeah, but what is? Is what that is, is all? Is that all Bush's fault, right? No, but what is the debt that Bush ran up? Bush. Okay. Uh, am I? Well, I'm not. I'm well, not. Well. Well. No. You see, look. No. 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 Bush no. Bush no. is gone. Bush is gone. Bush I'm is not gone. defending Bush. Bush is gone. But I'm not defending him. This isn't a question of defending Bush. It's sure a question, it is. No, it's not. You're just, it's a, it's you're a saying, question of putting our issues in context. No, no, no. And I know context isn't a Ridiculous. proper... You're saying, look, yeah, my guy ran up six trillion in debt, but what did Bush do? Come on. It's ridiculous. It doesn't matter what Bush did. If we, the if, job of the president now is to get the debt under control, and right. you, you gotta exactly. cut stuff. So, 
exactly. So right now, the debt is steady. Right now, what we've done is bounce it. So no, we haven't bounced the debt. Are you kidding me? We have a one deficit. trillion dollar we deficit. Have the deficit holding steady. Now you need to go up on the mountain. It's not holding steady. One, it's, it's a trillion dollars and plus in 13. That's the deficit. Another trillion, right. Stewart. Just, in other words, it hasn't increased year to year. Oh, it hasn't increased. Are you kidding me? If he's reelected the president, we'll have a $20 trillion deficit, even if he takes all your stuff. All right? It's not going to matter. Here's what I don't understand. Your party on Bullshit Mountain I'm believes. I'm not in a party. Right. <laughs> okay. You believe that because this other president is out of office, that the Republican Party sprang like Athena out of Zeus's head, <laughs> newborn when Barack Obama was inaugurated. Here's why it matters about our debt and our deficit under Bush. What he created was a society of entitlement that we could have two wars that cost $800 billion and cut taxes at the same time. So if you look at the debt as a measure of it, we have $16 trillion in debt. $10 trillion of it occurred under the Bush presidency. Now, why is that no, important? No, no. Because the policies that he's enacted... didn't occur under the Bush presidency. That was the total debt since George Washington, all right? No. You zipped it on no, up. No, sir, that look, is not correct. Look, we had a surplus under Clinton. A surplus. A surplus. Of, a surplus, a of, surplus under Clinton. No, the no, debt no, no, had no. been X'd out. Oh, 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 so no, the, Bush took no, the us debt wasn't X'd out. You're mixing up the deficit dollars. with the debt. No, he took us. No, 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 no. You're missing the deficit with the deficit is yearly spending. The that. debt is cumulative. The debt wasn't wiped 1. out. 1.7 trillion in Bush tax cuts, yes? That was Look, part of the debt. I'm not going to defend Bush or the Republican Party. I'm going to tell you one thing. Yes. The highest tax revenues in the history of this nation occurred in 2007. The government got more money from we the people right. than any other time in history under the Bush tax the rich tax cuts. All right? Because everybody was working. Everybody was investing so that the government got all the money in 2007 highest revenue. Now the class warfare game is we'll boost revenue by taxing the rich. You know how much that is going to bring in a year? Do you, ha you know how much? 80 billion a year. Okay, it's actually 90. 90 billion, 90 billion a year because he's, he's making a lot of money over So that here. would be 900 right. billion dollars over 10 years, but seriously, right. we need That's to get rid of NPR. That's nothing. That's like <laughs> nothing. Let's move on to entitlements. That's not nothing. Oh, entitlements. Are you still here? I am. All right. <laughs> So I'm glad I was there. invited. Hanging in. The, let's go to entitlements. And yes. you get to go first this time, John. The Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post yes. recently reviewed census data. Report 49% of American households got entitlements last year. And that entitlement spending climbed even as we started moving out of the recession. So, John, do you think the expansion of entitlements is necessary? And is there a possibility it's turning us into a nation of takers? Well, first of all, we're an entitlement nation. We were born that way. We're a country that came to another country with people on it and went, yeah, I think we'll have that. Yeah, that'll be nice. <laughs> have you ever seen Oprah's favorite things episode? We, people, we are people that want free things. <laughs> we're not an entitlement nation. We are an entitlement species. But the point of this is, has this president fundamentally changed the relationship between entitlements and the government. And that is why it's important to look at his predecessors and what has gone before it. Barack Obama hasn't increased and expanded your ability to get welfare and food stamps by broadening the pool. More people have fallen into the social safety net that exists there because, as we talk about, $2.5 trillion of money went out of our economy in the bank crisis in two weeks. So we can all talk about how the government is spending too much money and the free market has to take us out of it, but nobody talks about the flip side of the free market, which is the bust. And we have to start understanding how they can no longer privatize their profits and socialize their losses. They can no longer begin to take all that money and when it goes out, suddenly complain 
that somehow the 20% of people that are hungry, that are not doing well, and by the way, 2% of people get welfare as we know it. The 2% of the people, I don't know where this 20% comes from. I don't know what the figure is. I don't even know what you're talking uh, about. I have the figures right here. Would you like to know? I would like okay. to know. Okay, here we have. Thir 107 million people live in homes. This is 35% of the American population, mm -hmm. all right? That uh, get means-tested entitlements. That's not Social Security, okay. not, not Medicare, all right? That means some kind of food stamp or some kind of thing. But look, nobody begrudges people who need it uh, a safety net. But right now, we have this mindset that, you know what, if tough, times are tough, I'm going to take what I can take. Let me ask you this. Do you know what uh, disability, federal disability is now under President Obama? It's almost doubled, all right? Let me ask okay. you this question. So is the workplace he, that much dangerous, much more dangerous? As soon as he came into office, things got but that's really a, tough? But that's a ridiculous statistic. No, First of all, there, there, he hasn't expanded your ability to get it. He has not made it easier no, to get disability. more people are applying right. for it because, because it's we're the getting, mindset. No, it's we're getting... It's the Zorba the Greek uh, mindset. We're getting Let's old. Go. Here we are. The government will give it to us. Here's the that's statistics on that. The statistics on that are... 40 to 50 year olds, that has stayed steady. The largest increase in disability is people ages 60 and above. And it's not people dropping bowling balls on their foot and not wanting to work anymore. It's arthritis. Let me ask you a question. Wait, and this, wait, so and there's I mean a lot this. more arthritis now than there was four years ago. Hell just, yeah. There's a plague just came in of arthritis. And it's, not, and it's not four years ago, it's nine million more people. But let me ask you this, and I say this because this is an important point as well. Because one of the things that happens on Bullshit Mountain is this. When you need something, it's an entitlement. When they need something, hey man, it just is what it is. So I'm gonna ask you this. Who's they? Now you, Who's they? Where did you grow up? In Levittown, Long Island. Let me describe a town to you if I could. Imagine a town yeah. that is inhabited by people who had their education paid for by the government. And the entire town is built through subsidies low mortgages that go through there. Do you know what that town would be called? Havana. Levittown. Oh, Levittown that's not, that's, is based oh, on no, no, the no. GI Bill and subsidized housing. It was created for veterans coming back from no, World no, no. War II. The housing wasn't subsidized. It was pinhead. absolutely subsidized no, with low it. mortgages. The low mortgages. low mortgages. The houses stayed the same. The Levitt brothers made billions. I understand. All right? So they the houses weren't, weren't subsidized. subsidized. Your it was low mortgage rates for, them for the guys who was fought. subsidized. It's subsidized housing. Right. So. You grew up in subsidized housing, my friend. Second of all, when your father left his business, yes. what did he leave with? When, what did he leave? His shoes. No. What did he take when he left? Tell the truth. What did he take? He filed for what? He filed for Social Security? No. What? Disability. No, he didn't. <laughs> oh, you talking about... Yeah. You're talking about... From his company. Oh, from his company, not yeah. from the government. Oh, so that's okay. See, well, he this had, is the problem. He had colitis. Okay. Well, he, had you know, he had colitis. I see. So and he, he didn't. He didn't. Wait a minute. Hold it. All right. He didn't file a federal. He, I see. To his company. Uh -huh. And what do you do if your company doesn't provide that? What do you do? Yeah. You but you have colitis. Company. But you have colitis, and you don't have a company. You work Look, for the government. Nobody begrudges. What do you do? Wait. 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 Nobody begrudges people who are ill on the job. You're, if they're ill on the job. You just begrudged. No, no, no. You've I don't been begrudge begrudging anybody. all night. This is nothing but begrudging. All night long, begrudge, hold begrudge. Hold it, hold it, hold it. You make a judgment. Sandra Pluck doesn't need what she wants. Old people don't need disability. Nobody needs that because it's coming out of your pocket. But when your family needed it, well, it was colitis and he had it through the private sector and it was, <laughs> it's always different. <laughs> It was through the private sector. What is wrong with you? He worked for a company. Because he not was everybody Ill. works for a company it that doesn't provides matter. that. If they, if they genuinely need it, there's no beef. If they genuinely need it, there's no beef. Nobody but you're telling me in the last four years, the workplace, what, uh, arthritis has swept in and, and twice as many people have it than they did four years ago? Look. This goes back to buy your own, okay? The mindset is, if I can gin the system, I'll do it because it's easy. Because we can do it now because that's the culture. Do you not see the riots in the street in Spain and Italy and Greece? Do you not see them? What are they rioting about? Cutbacks 
in their entitlements mm -hmm. paid for by the government, not Caltex. <laughs> All right? But the point and is hold that. it, hold it, hold it. Right. And my father's salary, a portion of it, went into that fund in case he needed that disability. Let me he ask doesn't you a know the difference between the private and the public sector. We don't have any beef with private companies providing whatever they want. That's the free marketplace. But when you get a Sandra Fluck saying, I'm entitled to my birth control paid for by the taxpayer, that's insane. All right? We have to understand as a society, we have already decided to take care of people who need help. That's the society that we have. Help. Who need help? Who if need help? But nobody is arguing that people with fraudulent claims should get them. Okay, then what, you explain. What the argument should I be is. I want to know on yes. your platform yes. why there's an explosion in disability in four years. What is it that has come in so to your cause so many is, more people to Barack be Barack Obama Ill? came into office and everybody went, Lord Happy have mercy, I don't again. have to work here anymore. Here we are. Barack Obama is here. Barack Obama did not change the rules for entitlements in this country. He made it they, a lot easier to get not. them. Sure he did. He didn't. They advertise on the radio for food stamps. Are you kidding me? Why is it that if you take advantage of a tax break and you're a corporation, you're a smart businessman, but if you take advantage of something that you need to not be hungry, you're a moocher? What kind of business is that? It's ridiculous. Let's say this. See, here's the problem with Bullshit Mountain. Let me get this in here. They don't see the connection between government action and moving forward. Here's an example. At the Republican convention, there was a woman up there who had won four gold medals in shooting. A wonderful, exciting American story. And when she was on stage at the Republican convention, she talked about how the women at the Olympics crushed it, did great, won more medals than women at the Olympics had ever won in the history of the Olympics. The U.S. women would have finished ninth if they were a country. And they celebrated that at the Republican convention, rightfully so, on We Built It Night, the night where they all came out and talked about how they didn't need anything, they were the ones that did it. What they never talked about, and the connection they never drew was, in 1972, the government instituted Title IX. <laughs> Title IX took that money by force, and through fairness, and they took that money and they made it distributed more equitably through the schools. It was an enormous controversy and it paid off at the Republican National Convention <laughs> with a woman talking about gold medals. There is a connection when the government invests in infrastructure and its people and the success of this country. Let's, let's, move, let's move on. And Let's go. <laughs> Climbing the mountain. Um, let's move to the Middle East. The Middle East. Wait, where did we just go? Let's go to the Middle East. The Middle just went East. to the Middle East? Bin Laden is what? dead. What? He's here? American... <laughs> American troops are out of Iraq. However, even after the troops surged, the Taliban alive and well in Afghanistan. And increasingly, it appears that groups like Ansar al-Sharia are picking up where bin Laden left off. So how would you rate the president's policy in the Middle East? Bill, we start with you. Um, some of the president's policies against terrorism are very good, OK? Uh, particularly the drones. <laughs> drones, yes. Waterboards, no. OK? I want, later, you can explain this to me. Waterboarding, no. We can't do that. However, we will drop a missile in the middle of town and wipe out everyone. <laughs> That's OK. But waterboarding, no. Let me agree with Bill O'Reilly and say, I agree on both these counts. We shouldn't waterboard people or drop missiles into the middle of the village. Okay. I like the missile. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pretty down with that. OK. There's By the way, there logical is a thinking, though, you know. being on the field right. of battle and uh, being captured. I mean, right. there is, there's always been sort of a rule that once you capture okay. somebody, you don't torture them. But that's the whole other thing. Muslim Brotherhood, not our friends, all right? Get a clue. Not our friends. So that's a mistake that uh, the president has made in the Middle East. He's done a good job on terrorism, by Let the way. Let me ask I you think. about Libya and Syria, because... Well, can I, can I uh, just very quickly? Yes, you may. Uh, 
again, we have to feel it's sorry just, for the Muslim it's, it's interesting about the short-term memory loss on the mountain we discussed earlier. <laughs> In 2001, 2002, all we heard about was America must spread democracy to the Middle East. We must, even if it means invading their country, to get them to have elections. All we had to do was spread democracy because democracy was going to keep us safe. And now we have democracy breaking out in Egypt and Libya and Tunisia, but because we didn't cause it and we didn't invade those countries and they're voting for themselves, now we have a problem with who they selected. Unfortunately, with democracy, the whole idea of it is we don't get to install the leader of that country. Okay, but that country gets to install the leader. Now, you may believe that that leader is not good for America, but that's not your choice anymore. And a policy eight years ago of spreading democracy throughout the Middle East has suddenly become as long as they choose the people we find acceptable. Well, of course you're going to have that idea. But wait a minute, I don't get to choose? You get a president and you get a dead ambassador, you get to choose on how you react to that. All right? So if you're going to kiss their butts over there, they ain't going to respect you, and that's what's happening. See, once let again, me it's break the it simple to you. Let me break it to you, Stuart. As long as Here, let me break it to you. Yes. Another card. Iran, not frightened. Really? Not frightened. Really? Okay? There's you the big bomb having, right they're there. They're riots. They're not scared. They're having currency riots as we speak. Yeah. They're not scared of us. They may be scared of the real. They're not scared of us. And the reason is not anything that the president has done overtly because he, he hasn't backed off or anything like that. That's mm -hmm. foolish. But the signal he sends mm -hmm. to the world is, hey, let's have a conversation. No, you're right. All right? You're right. And his voice goes up five octaves. No, you're right. Sometimes the, you have to say. If the president would only lower his voice. Like this. And put a stern look on his face. Like this. I think Iran will give up their nuclear ambitions. Yeah. And I believe, I believe in my oh, soul. Here, here, here's a clue for you, another one. All Barack Obama has to do is go on a double date with Bibi, uh, with Netanyahu, okay? Just double date with him, all right? Go anywhere with him. That sends a little message to Tehran. Hey, whoa, they might be making up some stuff. Maybe we want to take a look at this, all right? But, 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 when you say, when you say, I think you're, hey, you want to be the secretary of senility. Look, this is not, that's not a diplomatic policy to say, let's go on a double date with Netanyahu, and then Tehran you says. a little message, all right? But when you say, gee, what does sanctions gee, Netanyahu, do? I really can't meet with you because I have to go on The View. That doesn't send a big message. And meantime, they're polishing up the little bomb over there, going, he's going on The View. He's not going to talk to Netanyahu. So did they attack our embassy because Barack Obama is weak? They're not afraid of us. Did they attack our embassy because Barack Obama is weak? Did they attack it because he's weak? And because they're not afraid of us anymore. The uh, authorities in Egypt could have and should have put the army in front of the embassy and stopped about, it. Are you they about did. Or are you they, about hey, Egypt? they did not do that because they knew they are knew there would not Libya be or a reprisal. They would not do it. They, that's why they did not do it. So the guy with the drone army that drops missiles into these towns is the one that's soft on terror, and that has what There's allowed... There's a difference between terror and coddling governments. There's a difference. And the, Mu and the Muslim Brotherhood in Cairo... Are you talking about Libya made a calculation. They, look, you know they made a calculation. Everybody knew that embassy was going to get hit. And in the Libya Egyptians, or in Egypt? We're talking about Egypt now. But I thought we were talking about Libya. <laughs> it's, but the guy wasn't killed in Egypt. He was killed happened, in Libya. Stuart. A number of things happened. I know a number of things happened, right. but the guy... You know, our, our ambassador to Muslim Libya was the Muslim Brotherhood, they're in Egypt. It wasn't the Muslim Brotherhood that attacked the Libyan embassy. It was uh, Al-Qaeda, was it not? I mean, am I... Uh, you want to explain it to him or should I? Well, let me ask there you... There were two separate me... attacks. No, there were no, 19 separate attacks. No, there were, no, the, no, no, there were two, <laughs> two that made... All the, around a bunch two of different countries. that made worldwide headlines. Here's all I'm going to say. One in Libya, Under Bush, one in Egypt. There were nine attacks on what? American consulates. So the idea, once again that somehow there is a fundamental change because Barack Obama is in office is a fiction. Like the whole thing has been a fiction. That somehow, if Barack Obama talked more like a cowboy and was nicer to Israel, somehow the Arab world would go, oh, I had no idea you guys would get mad at us for that. 
let me okay. let me ask you about oh, wait, the Benghazi consulate. One more thing. Consulate. One more thing. One more thing. The, so you're you're kind of happy the way things are going me? in Iran. <laughs> Bill, not, be quiet. I am not happy the you're, way you're things. You're kind of happy about Iran, where they're going. You're kind of happy about this yes. policy. So basically, negating your premise means I'm happy. I don't know. I don't know where you are. I don't. Here's you're Egypt. I, you're here's, Libya. Here's you're, where you're, I am. Uh, Bob, who, Democracy you know, in the Middle East over there. is their right as human beings, and we are not ones who can tell them. Who they or who not they can elect, you know, and it is a difficult and this is crazy. dangerous and volatile no, 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 situation. No. Nobody's saying you tell them about their democracy. You tell them you attack our embassy one more time, we're cutting off all our aid and pulling everybody out of there. That's what you tell them, like we did in Lebanon. That's what you tell. Them. Like we did in Lebanon with Reagan. Like we did in Lebanon with Reagan. You don't like call we did under your... Bush with all the attacks on the consulates. Right, now Bush we're back had the to same Bush. attacks. Bush is gone. He's gone. But why are you holding one president to a different standard because than the I other? Because I don't have time to hold Martin Van Buren to a standard than Obama. He's in this office. This is not ancient history. This is just eight years ago. Why can't Let we deal with it in the context of have, both presidencies? Let me yeah. ask you about the Benghazi consulate. Because right. we know that our, our ambassador is, is killed there. Other Americans killed. The consulate is attacked. CNN and the Washington Post get reporters in there in four days. Three weeks later, the U.S. government gets investigators in there with the FBI. And part of the reason they say is because it took a long time to get the Libyan government to approve us going in there to investigate what happened at our consulate. We have to respect that. Should we have to wait for approval? Of course. We, they're a democracy. If they don't want to let us in, we, we can't go in. No, we should just do whatever we want whenever we want. When there's a dead American ambassador, I think we should do whatever we want. I, I agree that things have to be dealt with in, uh, in, in a, uh, a timely fashion, but you're making, again, a I'm false not, choice. That was her. She made I'm the sorry. false statement. It's a, it's a false choice that somehow, I think this whole situation in Libya has been mishandled by the United States government. I'm not sure why they haven't been able to get their story straight. I don't know, so I'm not going to defend that. But what I am trying to do is look at it in the larger context of American foreign policy. And that's the question of this. This somehow this idea that we project weakness and suddenly all these countries are going to take advantage of us is a fiction. And I don't believe that this president uh, has projected a gigantic weakness around the globe or that attacking Iraq and uh, 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 occupying that country projected a strength around the world. I just think that is an incorrect assumption. Phil to, to be pretty blunt, and it's not this president, it's a lot of presidents, mm -hmm. it appears that the American foreign policy has been to go into the Middle East and try to buy friends. Does that ever work? Yeah, we can buy friends. <laughs> I bought. I think it yeah, worked. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes you got to deal with unsavory people if they're uh, helping you in some way. And it's mm -hmm. the way of the world. The history's always been... Look at that. Look at FDR and Stalin. I mean, my God. So, look, it's a difficult thing in the Wait Middle a East. Can we just go and back and contrast that with what you just said about the Muslim Brotherhood? Just very quickly. So, when it comes to Saudi Arabia, hey, look, sometimes you got to deal with unsavory people. When it comes to the Muslim Brotherhood, look, we got to go in there and we got to tell them, you come near us again and we're going to bomb you. That's right. Okay. Here, here's the difference they attacked our embassy in Cairo. The Saudis didn't do anything. But you're assuming that it was attacked through a it concerted effort by effect. Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood and not, let's no, say, no, just not, a I'm gang assuming, of people. I don't care if it was, I don't care if it was uh, Jerry and the Pacemakers who attacked it, all right? They could this have stopped the, it. This is on the internet, Bill. I really don't think Jerry and the Pacemakers is the reference to make. <laughs> you know, you know who they are. Let me just explain something very quickly. Right now, Bill O'Reilly's audience is calling my audience on the phone to try and figure out how to download this thing. So, trust me, that is not the reference to be making. Let's, For the let's third move time, on. it doesn't matter, all right? All right. Whether Lil Wayne attacked. All right? <laughs> Boom! It doesn't matter. Boom! That was nice. The government could that have stopped nice. it, and they didn't. All right? That's thumb in the eye, and that's, you better not do it again. That's what the American president has to do. Thomas Jefferson and the Barbary Pirates. Oh, Jesus. <laughs>
Moving on to media bias, Vice Presidential Candidate Paul Ryan says that most people in mainstream media are left of center and they want a very left of center president. So, John, is there this media bias or is that bunk? Uh, I mean, it depends. I, you know, again, I think that Fox News is an overreaction to what may be a patina of people that believe in, in other words, I don't think ABC and NBC and CBS are activist organizations for liberal causes. I think Fox looks at those organizations and they are sort of an autoimmune disease against that. They, <laughs> Fox News is sort of the lupus of news. <laughs> they are, they have seen something, it is, it is there with a sousson, and Fox News has gone overboard. Uh, well, hey. Uh, <laughs> FNC making more than a billion dollars a year, so mm, something's going right. I worked at ABC and yes. CBS. You can't make money right. selling crap in you this worked country, at, that's uh, for sure. <laughs> this won't happen. This can't have it. It's not like crack and honey boo-boo at the top of the... <laughs> right. Go ahead. We'll ignore this immature stuff. Um, <laughs> Let me ask you about Paul's bill. Wait, 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 no, no, no. You worked at CNN, I worked at ABC and CBS. Mm -hmm. The culture is left wing, and how that plays out is, he's right, they're not like marching in the newsroom with we love Che signs, but it's who they hire, all right? It's who gets promoted, it's what they put in front of you as far as story count is concerned, what stories they concentrate on, what stories they ignore. Mm -hmm. All of that plays in, and that's why Fox News is successful, because it gives voice to traditional conservatives at the same level as liberal voices. And in, in my show in particular, which is the big monster, you know that, we put one to one. It's yes. one to one. No, it's absolutely we, fair. Right. You're right. <laughs> you run the other night. I think, I think any time you run an organization where more people believe that the president is a Muslim than believe in evolution is a problem. What organization is that? And where did you come up with that? Hey, look at the viewers, man. They've, they've done polls of your viewers more than believe that the okay, president so is a Muslim. They did a poll of Fox evolution. News that said most employees at Fox News believe... No, 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 not employees. I'm sorry, viewers. I apologize. Oh, viewers. viewers, yeah, I apologize. You, most viewers. No, I don't know. It wasn't, I don't know. Oh, you don't know if it was most. Morality, but it was... It was more maybe a believe, couple. More a than, few, maybe. More than maybe, believed it was Maybe some in Wyoming. Uh, I got him. What else? <laughs> We're, we're going into the lightning round question. Lightning round. Lightning round. Are we in the lightning round? round. Yeah, we are. Wow. We are. Um, Bill is well known for carrying this pocket size. Bill is uh, not well known. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so jealous. Isn't Constitution jealous? and Declaration of Independence, which, by the way, is your Hanukkah gift this year. Thank you. Um, in, in the Declaration, the U.S. government is charged with making sure that we have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What else should the government have to give us, John? Other than life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? I don't know, that's pills. pretty all-encompassing. <laughs> well, let me put it this way. Let me, let me go to the Constitution then. Each. Let me go to the Constitution if I could. <laughs> because I think that's one of the things on Bullshit Mountain is they are the protectors of the Constitution in this country and freedom. And the rest <laughs> of the 50% of the people who don't live on the mountain that are parasitic and sucking the life out of them don't respect the Constitution. <laughs> so let's look at the first sentence of the Constitution, which says, we the people in order to form a more perfect what? LLC? No. Union, <laughs> union, to form a more perfect union, and in fact, promote the general welfare. The first sentence of the Constitution mentions unions and welfare. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <clears throat> I don't know what to tell you. It doesn't mention corporations, and it doesn't mention anything else. Unions and welfare, blame the founders. I do. <laughs> Because we as a country are only as strong as the weakest amongst us. As the New Testament tells us, the poor will always be with us. Wait what we Wait need to focus on is You're not whether me... or not to take care of them, but how best halt, to halt. efficiently bring the poor and those in need back into outrage. more productive this society. This is a total outrage. This is a... <laughs> this man has offended... This man... This man over here has offended every single American. Are you going to stand there? Are you sitting or standing? I read the Bible. Are you going to stand? Are you, you know what? Here's the thing. We I are am only, short. We are only as good. Short, but when you tell me I'm short, I don't blame the liberal weights and measures bureau or 
I don't suggest that my numbers are skewed and I'm really 6'1", if only the lamestream media would tell people. Yeah. I trust that I'm 5'7". That's right. And you don't know this, but the feds pay for that lift. All right? So he went in. But he's offended every single American by saying that we are only as good as our weakest link. I believe that. We're only as good as CNN. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? But that is why we have to work to help CNN out of this terrible yes. predicament that they're in. Right, right on. We need to work together. Right on. And help CNN reintroduce and this, themselves and this to guy productive too, society. Right, here, right there. Next question. A lot of folks don't realize that you chose Washington, D.C. so they could supersize their Slurpees. Because you can't have it in New York. New York, yes. Big Apple, small soda that state. That is true. Should the government be counting calories for us? Well, that depends. Should the, should the government be counting calories? I think the government should allow what adults size to. Soda we can buy and we can consume. Yeah, I think adults should be able to buy uh, whatever it is they wish uh, to buy. Now, that being said, we have a health crisis in this country. And uh, I know that Mitt Romney is fond of saying, well, the emergency room takes care of that for people who don't have uh, insurance. <laughs> I personally believe that. Uh, this idea that everyone should have insurance is a very smart one because it takes the socialism out of our health care program so that we're not all paying for those who are poor to go to the uh, health of facilities. We're paying Everybody for would it. have. Who do you think's paying for the 20 million that don't have insurance? Who do you think's paying for them? No, I'm saying that. That's why it's important. We're paying for them. No, I know I'm saying that. Okay. <laughs> we're paying for them. If you hadn't looked down at your cards, you'd have followed this. <laughs> I, 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 I was listening to every word, but I couldn't follow it. What was the question again? You must, go... <laughs> you must lose your mind in a Kinko's. Oh, you're crazy. <laughs> We're going to the next one. <laughs> Should the government supersize that? They no, already supersized. They're, they're, I have one of these they tell us. <laughs> <laughs> they tell us what size soda you can have because Look, they're talking about New York. Take care. This is Bloomberg. He has nothing it's to Bloomberg, do. But Come yeah. on. Let's go. I'll tell you what. One I of like. your favorite topics. The grades on the restaurants. I like that. You like the what? The grades, the grades on the restaurants, the grading system. One rat, two rat, three rats? Yeah. Yeah, I like that. A, B, C, D, right. I think that works out. What rodent is uh, one, the plot One of the favorite jour? topics the two of you have is, is there a war on Christmas? And if there has been this war on Christmas, <laughs> who won? Uh, that's not fair. War on Christmas? Here? Come on. Let me handle this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah no. In this country, I believe that this Christmas thing, look, I think people have confused not being able to pray everywhere with not being able to pray anywhere. And I think they've confused the loss of absolute power with persecution. And the idea that Christmas, I'm a Jew. <laughs> if you think Christmas isn't celebrated in this country as Christmas, walk a mile in Hanukkah shoes, brother, because <laughs> you have no idea. Now, I get it. Let me say this. I get it. They are celebrating the birth of their savior, and I dig that. That's an important thing, and we're celebrating that the oil lasted longer than we thought it would, all right? It's not, it's not equivalent, necessarily, but, but when I hear them complaining about, oh my God, I mean, Fox News, the headquarters of Fox News is what, on, in Rockefeller Center. If you walk outside of Fox News, it looks like Santa Claus exploded in December. <laughs> There's the Christmas Spectacular at Radio City Music Hall. There's the Rockefeller Christmas tree. Like, this whole idea is insanity. Yeah, I know. First of all, we, won, know. we won the war on Christmas, number one. And number two, <laughs> the reason it was launched, the reason, it, the was, reason launched. it was launched, you remember, is the ACLU, all right? Filed a number of lawsuits against uh -huh. little towns. Yes. They had the baby Jesus in the manger yes. in the square, along with the menorah, along with the star and crescent, along with the McDonald's logo. Everybody was there. All right? Well, but as, as long as you're not being that, Baby Jesus, uh, get him out of there. Slap the baby Jesus. Yes. All right. <laughs> they filed lawsuits. Law yes. suits yes. on paper. Yes. All right? Now, yes. how we won? Barack Obama dropped the drone on ACLU headquarters. Boom, they're done, all right? Good. In addition. And by the way, why do we say Merry Christmas more than one day? It's a birthday, right? Like, when it's your birthday, do people that whole month be like, happy birthday? Like, no. 
It's one day. Why shouldn't you say happy holidays during the season? It's two holidays. It's Christmas and New Year's. That's plural. Why would you just say Merry Christmas? Merry Christmas is actually incorrect. To say Merry Christmas to someone on December 23rd, Jesus should just be like, it's not my birthday, dude. <laughs> Immigration reform! Why not? Why haven't we heard of them talking about that? <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> oh, no, I think, again, uh, uh, again, if you were uh, yeah. uh, to look at the situation, it is, uh, uh, I think, a smart thing to get uh, children of immigrants who have been illegal, had nothing to do with it, into the system. And uh, I actually think it'd be much smarter if we would find a way uh, to secure the border, but take care of the people who are illegal that are here and give them a path to citizenship. But I don't know why we're talking about this in that manner, because uh, we're just going to build a wall, actually double wall, and uh, a moat with crocodiles. And <laughs> Joe Arpaio is just going to walk back and forth <laughs> with that a flashlight. I don't, I don't have any beef. I, I think that you should uh, be humane, uh, in the, because it's the federal government's fault to mess anyway. They did it. I saw these people on there. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Did you, you don't see, have any did you Europa see how the, Did you see how the Telemundo guys uh, worked your guy over, though, right. on the, uh, hey, you promised to do something and you didn't do anything? Did you see that? Did you see the interview? I did the see Telemundo it. Yeah, yeah, I saw it. And they said in it's Spanish amazing and that English. The liberal so left-wing like media. Yeah, they would, would doing that. Do that kind of and then, and yeah. then the president said, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I saw, I saw. Okay. And that was the best interview, by the way, these Telemundo people. That was the best one so far in the campaign. You think? Yeah, they haven't come through me yet, though. Neither. And I'm such a Republican shill, Mitt Romney's kicking my door in to get in there, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> military service. Should there be mandatory military or public service? Is that a good idea? Uh, I think that what we've done with the military in this country is tragic. I think that there is a bill that was in the Senate that Republicans filibustered, that Senator Tom Coburn put a hold on, that was a billion dollar jobs bill for veterans that he said we're not paying for and we should not fund and therefore it should not happen. Yet he and many of those other senators had no uh, problem spending $800 billion to make those people veterans, even though that money wasn't funded or paid for by taxes. So I think it's atrocious what we've done to veterans. And secondly, that is another thing. The idea that we sent these guys off to war, we didn't pay for it, we didn't ask for any sacrifice. Bush said, we are in a generational war, a war of our lives, but don't worry, we're not going to raise taxes and we're not going to make you go fight it or have any sacrifices. It is uh, outrageous, and I think there should be a draft, not necessarily just for the military, but kids should have at least one year where they have to do some form of service, whether it be military or public service or something along those lines. And that's what I would vote for. Um, I, I'm against the draft. You know, I'm against the draft because uh, the, the, the way it is now, we need a very good professional armed forces. We have it. We have the best armed forces in the world. I don't know the bill that you're referring to. I'd have to see what the, you know, there, there are rioters on a lot of these bills. So the, it sounds, the headline sounds good, and there's 15 things underneath. That might have been derailed. But I'm, Stuart and I are pretty simpatico on this. So we got to do everything we can for military people to make sure they're rewarded when they come home. Because they had a really rough go of it in Afghanistan and Iraq. It was in both places. Awful, terrible theaters. Uh, we should not have gone to Iraq. Afghanistan, we had to. Um, <laughs> let's have Somebody a better live tweet that, motherfuckers. Come on. <laughs> live tweet that. Bill O'Reilly, we should not have gone into Iraq. We should. Point, we're moving to the center. They're going to bring some chairs oh, we're out gonna here. Oh, we're going to get a little more And we're going to get to... What's going to happen now? What's you're going to move out here. We're, we're going to move out there? Yes. Do I still get my you lift? Do. Does, you yeah, do. Yeah, he needs to get Leave your lift. Do you have an extra cushion and for him? And I think you all... <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> you all were given uh, cards when you came in. People could write well, down questions. Chairs. They've look selected those. Only the finest Corinthian leather. The <laughs> that is nice, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. The, uh, the internet audience also has been able to... By the way, Hill didn't Pose want to questions. sit next to him. That's why I have to sit next to him. <laughs> Not true. Appreciate <laughs> <laughs> sure. it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're going to take away one of the chairs and play a little music. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. see, what, see what happens. Let's start with that. Dean from Tennessee uh, wants to ask this question about the election. What do you think will be the greatest determining factor in the outcome of the 2012 election? Dean's here in the audience. Phil? Dean! No, he's not. No, he's not. He is. <laughs> Raise your hand. He's in the movies. <laughs> Dean left. <laughs> um, I think that uh, it's going to be very close. Next debate, very big. Um, because the final debate's on foreign policy, and people are more interested in the economy and stuff like that. So that, that's going to be like that. Now, the next debate, though, is really it's an interesting debate because it's a town hall, which means guys get up there and say, well, I know that. So about three-fourths of the debate. <laughs> Wait, who's, who's debating in this again? What is it? <laughs> it's the regular folks ask the question. I, and I saw my cousin, you know, <laughs> so. A lot of air time that's going to be lost. I would just rather have them like Stuart and me, wouldn't you, right up here? <laughs> hey, that's how to do it. John? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, fine. <laughs> this uh, question from the internet, uh, Jeffrey from Utah. The current way we elect our president disenfranchises millions of voters by making only a few states count in the actual election. It forces presidential candidates to focus on just a few and ignore the rest. So wouldn't making the popular vote the deciding factor be a more effective way to choose our president? John? Jeffrey's not kidding around. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I have no problem with that. Uh, the Electoral College makes absolutely no sense to me. So I, I have no problem with there being a popular <laughs> vote. And uh, the people I feel bad for, honestly, if I live in Ohio, I'm just annoyed that every four years, uh, this phalanx of candidates and reporters descend on my state, promise me the moon, and then November 7th or 8th, fly the hell out of there and don't come back for another four years. And I would think that that is uh, incredibly frustrating uh, for a state, uh, probably even more frustrating than being a state like, uh, you know, New York or another state that's uh, so solidly either blue or red that nobody even bothers to visit it. I, I think it's, it's frustrating. I disagree entirely. Um, <laughs> if you have a popular vote, then New York, L.A., these people control. All right, so the people in Wyoming and the people in Colorado, I have no talk. We live in a, a polarized time now, so it, it, there are only eight states really in play, and yes, that's where the election is going to be decided. But that's going to change, all right? Um, it used to be the South was all Democrat, now it's all Republican. It's going to change as the parties evolve and things happen. I think there's going to be a third party, by the way, that's going to come, all right, soon. And that third party is going to change the dynamic of the whole election. But I like the electoral college system. I think the from what I understand, uh, there is a third party, and uh, Gary Johnson is running. Yeah. As... <laughs> That's your, lo your local pot dealer, by the way, uh, right there. Rufus. That, that is, you don't normally hear that kind of a uh, Peter Brady voice crack, yeah. Um, <laughs> In, 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 a, in an election debate, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, what happens when, that's what happens when you inhale deeply. <laughs> we have another question from uh, one of the members of the audience here. It's from Allison from Allison. New Jersey. She says, if the U.S. were burning, what famous person would you save and why? <laughs> Bill, you want to hit that one first? If the U.S. were burning, what famous person would, would I save, save and why? And why? If the U.S. was burning. Yeah. I, I How would, long were you waiting in line, Allison? <laughs> I would save Oprah. She's worth about $100 billion. <laughs> Who would you say? Uh, my family. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, listen. But hey, listen. Oprah's a great answer, too. <laughs> From the internet, Alex from California writes, if either of you are supreme ruler of the civilized world. Yes! <laughs> you have opened a can of worms there. What type of government would you put in place? John? <laughs> I would put in place uh, pretty much what we have, which is... Socialism. A social democracy. <laughs> Look, you're socialist too, dude. If you're for dude? social security... <laughs> And if you're for Social Security and Medicare, we're all socialists. This argument is about what shade of red we are. That's it. It's like that old joke about, you know, would you sleep with me for a million dollars? Sure. No. Would you sleep with me for a dollar? No, no. but we've already established right, so what you are. So you'd be a socialist and we'd live in Cuba. I would put in, um, 
pretty much uh, a more participatory democracy. So I, I would basically, Mob rule. Here, here's what I would do. <laughs> this is unconstitutional now, but you would have to vote to be able to vote the next time. You see, if you sat it out one time, then you'd miss a round. So I would say, look, you have a- Yeah, let's a, do it like a game of shoots and ladders. Right. <laughs> you, have an, you have an obligation. If you land on red, you can only vote for congressional elections. I, I wanna, I, I, I want the folks. Goes. I want the folks to be more involved because right now we the have 50% 50, 50 of the people know nothing. Jersey Shore people, you know these people. <laughs> the Colbert watchers. <laughs> Natasha from Washington yeah. D.C. is here Not in the audience. Not everyone's as bright as the Fox viewer, but <laughs> we jealous. We can. Na Just jealous. Natasha uh, asked this question: How would you modify the health care system? if you were president? Bill? Well, I'd, I'd take care of this arthritis epidemic. I don't know where that is. <laughs> it's wiping us out. Well, who do you think has, a, has a, 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 let's put it this way. In terms of health care, do you think everyone should have it? I think everyone should have access to it. Do I think we should pay for people's health care who are able-bodied? No. Should we pay for veterans' health care? Yes. Uh, should we pay for, because uh, they deserve the best? They should have what they, my father had when he came back from World War II, is they should have discounted health care premiums, just like they got discounted mortgages. They should be rewarded for their service. So but they should have the best health care they should have? Well, the health care... Is, is, is the system that they have now the best they can have? The no, best that we I have to I, offer in no, this country? No, no, no. I, I think the whole health care system has to be reorganized in this country. In what way? It has to be basically run by insurance companies, not the government, all right? <laughs> listen to me, listen to me. Listen to me. I, I don't want to have to come down there. <laughs> you have the private insurance companies, however, they have mandates. They can't throw you off if you're sick. They have to keep basically... Did you just say mandates? Yes, <laughs> mandates. The government has an oversight capacity doesn't take it over because the government's going to screw it up. They have oversight capacity. And the insurance companies compete nationwide. The lizard can go to all the states. Right now, you can't do that. That drives it down, the cost of health insurance. It, it doesn't drive it down. It yes, just it makes does. it it's forces competition. everybody to know because in Alabama, the cost is very different than what is in New York City. And everybody from New York City then gets their insurance in the same way that your credit card rates no, come no, no. from. You get charged just what they state. want. In, in each state because of the difference in, uh, in the cost of living. However, you have 10 insurance companies in the market, not two. That's what's driving it up. Right now, they limit how many insurance companies can sell in your state. And I, of course you knew that, I'm sure you did. But I'd let everybody compete, which I would, drives Here's it what down. I would do with healthcare. I would decouple it from work. I would make sure that employers are not responsible for the healthcare, what that would do is free people up to have more mobility in terms of changing jobs, in terms of not worrying about illness, putting them into bankruptcy, and all those types of situations that we're in now. And the only way to do that is through a single payer system. And a single payer system is the only way that will effectively manage health care and keep costs down and make sure that employers, if you free up employers from having to put so many and so much of their money into insuring their employees, you will uh, create an enormous but you surge want the government of... to run this, all right? So that's where it's going to break down. The government can't. It's this not is, this set up to, to do it. This gets to a fundamental point. Some people say that the government that governs least governs best. I say the government that governs best governs best. The problem that we have is you look at this situation and you say, government can't do the job. They're not good enough. We're set well, up to do that. All you have to do is go to Canada or Britain and see what they have there. They run it, and you can't get an operation in Canada. They have to come here for it. And in Britain, everybody's teeth have fallen out. All right? <laughs> Just, I lived in England for a year. I know what the system is. The government can't no do one, it. No one in those places, though, goes broke 
because they have a medical condition Nobody because they're well, covered. So, they don't get good. They don't get good care. Well, what I'm saying is, do you think America can do it better? Let me put it this way: Is government? No, just, I don't is think Is government they can do incompetent? It is government in this area? Yes. What area is it competent in? It's competent in the military area. So why collecting can't we, taxes? But they it's can the do same that. Same people. Why is it that Not you trust the same people? You trust the government. To make bombs and invade another country. No, I don't. But not I don't to pass the government out to do that. But do you understand what I'm saying? Why is it that because the government is competent in military but can't handle health care? You healthcare? let medical people run it. You don't let the government run a complicated system. <laughs> Crazy. You and hire that, medical people into the system to help run it. Oh, I see. So you, you drag them out of their house and say you're going to come in and you're going to run our gut. That's come on. They're, look, just talk to, uh, to doctors. They don't want all this Obamacare. It's a mess. It's chaotic. It's not going to be cost efficient. Let the free market run it with very the free strict market oversight. Has been running it. 70 million people don't have insurance. That's right. So the free market has failed us no, in this No, you can instance. have government regulation of it. Just don't have them run it. So, but why are they able? Why is government able to run a complex organization like the military. Because Why are it's they it's tradition. They have hundreds of years of doing it. Well, 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 hold it, hold it. Did you miss the Revolutionary War? We have hundreds of years of doing it. Dr. Kildare did not work for the feds, all right? There's no basis for them to run the show. The that, only thing they that can- That may be the, the silliest thing, thing you've do said all night. Some, what? That may be the silliest thing you've What, that there's a military tradition in America? No, not that there's a military tradition, that because there's a military tradition, that's yeah. why the government runs an effective They military. know how to do that. They know how to organize that. They don't know the first thing about medical care and how to deliver it. It's insane. Doctors do, but they know how to organize a bureaucracy and administrate it. I'm not saying they're good at it. I'm saying, why not apply the military ethic the military work ethic, the sense of service, the sense of duty to country, to the healthcare system, bring up people that can learn how to do it, and create a system that can work for all Americans and be efficient at doing that. If we can figure out how to do, I was in uh, uh, Afghanistan, to see what they've built in the desert there is phenomenal. If you're telling me they can't set up clinics that can run effectively in this country, sure. that's ridiculous. You could set up you, clinics. You're saying you, that the military that, that's can doable. build nations in Iraq and Afghanistan, but they can't do it here. Why can't they take, there are medics in the military. Why not take the medics right. in the military, bring them into the government, and let them run the health care system? I, I feel, I feel. Bring them into the government? They're already in the government. Bring them Let in. Let them run it. I feel like I'm sitting next to Deepak it. Chopra here. And then we'll have chimes and whiz chimes everywhere. <laughs> oh, and then we'll have, they'll come and heal us. We'll be healed. Come, it's just, just, look, clinic's fine. <laughs> exactly they can't what run I it. said. <laughs> Deborah from Texas. I'm calling you Deepak. <laughs> Go ahead. Sends this in via the internet. How is it that two personalities such as yourselves who are almost polar opposites politically, share a willingness to come together when Congress can't. What advice would you give Congress? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. wait. And what would you like for Christmas, <laughs> little boy? <laughs> Get up. Thank William you. from Michigan <laughs> is here, and he, he asked this question. I understand voting for Obama uh, the first time. I understand voting for Obama the first time. What would justify voting for him this time? John? I, I, don't, I, I mean, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, kid. Uh, you know, it's a race between him and Mitt Romney. That would... <laughs> it's not... You know what? Here's what I would say. Turns out Lincoln ain't running this year. So, <laughs> you know, I think you got to look at it like, uh, you know, you, you, you judge it. But I don't think it's a slam dunk either way. I think for people who say, like, Obama is the worst president in history, which I guess is your program no, no, from no, 9 no. to 5. I told you, I, I, um, I'm not an you know, Obama I basher. Agree, I don't agree with that either. And uh, I think... Uh, 
there have been areas where he's done a very uh, effective job in stabilizing certain things that had really fallen into a catastrophic state with uh, that economic crisis that was the worst since the Great Depression. And there are areas where I think he's disappointed uh, people, but you know, uh, I don't know of a president that hasn't. And it's a choice between Mitt Romney uh, and Barack Obama, and that's how you'll make your judgment. Leslie from Michigan emails this in. Why don't we reduce or stop foreign aid with our deficit so high? Shouldn't aid to ourselves come first? If the USA becomes totally bankrupt, who would help us? What am I missing? Well, it's true that under President Obama, foreign aid is almost double in three years, and most people don't know that, but we are sending a lot. But we have to send money to certain countries to buy them, and we do. <laughs> we send money and we buy them. Um, Daddy, so can I have Peru? <laughs> <laughs> There's not that, that's not the big problem, foreign aid. It, it's a very, very small, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, but the, NPR, the ta the that's tax a problem. <laughs> that's symptomatic of it. The taxes that Stuart and I pay pretty much knock the foreign aid thing down. Go ahead. Jennifer from Maryland uh, writes this, she's in the audience. Who is your political hero and why? John? Now? Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, I would say Robert Kennedy. Um, I think uh, he had a passion and a depth of belief and an optimism and a tenacity uh, that I very much admired. And he was one of the first, when I was very young, one of the first people that I remember learning about. And, you know, maybe his death sort of left uh, uh, an indelible mark. But I, I felt that Robert Kennedy was a man of... of uh, Political integrity in that in that regard. I can't believe he said that. Why? Because I'm a big Kennedy, Robert Kennedy fan. Oh. I got a book out, Killing Kennedy. Oh, Robert for God's sake! <laughs> and Robert Kennedy is prominent in that book, and and you see what he just said <laughs> is true, unfortunately. Um, but what about Fidel? I know you like him. Yes. <laughs> I would say for me, and I really admire Robert Kennedy. Um, it would be Abraham Lincoln. And I have a book about Abraham. <laughs> and Abraham Lincoln gave his life for his country. He did. If you look at Abraham Lincoln, a big strapping six foot three guy, and he was chopping that wood. And in three years, in three years, he's hunched over, he's aged 35 years, he carried the whole thing on his back, kept the union together. Extraordinary individual. A really, we need an Abraham Lincoln now in this country. We you know somewhere. what? Here's a, here's a question that I think is right. Would an Abraham Lincoln in this day and age be an Abraham Lincoln, or would no, the tenacity of the 24-hour news cycle find a way to turn him into just no, some Lincoln skinny guy a, with a beard in that his can't, day, you know. In his day, Lincoln was the most hated man in the country. Uh, he, he didn't have the 24-7 drumbeat, but he couldn't go out. They were throwing stuff at him, and I mean, it, and particularly when the North was not doing well in the war. So it, it was inside Lincoln, not outside. And we need somebody like that. John from Minnesota emails in. Years ago, Walter Cronkite was called the most trusted man in America. To which news person, journalist, or reporter would, of course, you two excluded, <laughs> would you assign that title today? Got to be Bill Morris, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, in the same way that market shares divide, I just don't think that that is a, you know, a uh, relevant title in a country that is so niche oriented when it comes to the way people digest information. I just don't think there's, in the same way that we don't all share the same television experience, there is no most trusted man in America. There's a most trusted man on red sites, a most trusted man on blue sites. There are, uh, and I think that even the idea of exercising editorial authority has been diminished in some ways by your boss, uh, Ailes, who has felt, I think, I think what he's done is sort of created this idea that any exercise of editorial authority is elitist, while I think himself exercising pretty look, strong editorial That's not authority. true, because I can do whatever I want. He never interferes you're, with what you're I You're a say. different animal. Well, you're, you're I was the in the beginning. I was in the beginning. The absolute best journalist ever on television is the late Mike Wallace. Best, most honest, the guy was unbelievable. So that's, that's where I'm leaving. Mike is here in the audience, and he asks this question. If you could see any American elected president, who would you choose, and why? Oh, I'd say any Clint Eastwood would have to be my guy. 
Well, why don't we ask him? <laughs> um, so, uh... What? Tell them to do what? <laughs> Dirty Harry. He's gonna shoot you. I'll be honest with you. I think Bill Clinton would get elected in this country with 70% of the vote right now. I think he would. He, either he or Hillary could, could, could run right now and they would be elected with 70% of the vote. Both of them? I think they no. could run it as like a Edie Gourmet, Steve Lawrence Paul thing. And Paul. <laughs> I, think, I think that's how they could do it. Kendall and Avery are here in the audience. Kendall and Avery? Are here in the audience. That's my name of my indie band. <laughs> What do you think is the most fundamental problem with the public political discourse? Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I think, I think we've lost our ability to, uh, to, to problem solve, that we're having the wrong conversation in this country, that the conversation we're having in this country is about a fundamental clash of civilizations when I think we have basically agreed that we're a social democracy. Like, whether you want to get around it or not, this isn't a conversation between freedom and tyranny and capitalism and socialism. And until we lose that artifice and begin to concentrate on making, I, I think, I want government, I don't want it gone, I want it better. I want it more efficient, I want it accountable, I want it to be able to, uh, bureaucracies have huge problems and they need really smart administrators. And that's what this country and conversation should be about, not about one part of the country is somehow carrying the flag of freedom and the other part of the country is fundamentally undermining it. I think that's bullshit. The problem is that... <laughs> By the way, I have no idea what you said, but the problem <laughs> with the discourse deal... You went to Harvard, dude. Is, I know. No, just, <laughs> I had the same problem there. I, I, what? <laughs> The problem with the discourse deal is capitalism. That's the problem with it because... Wait, say it again. You, the problem with the discourse pro, um, situation in America is capitalism. Listen to me and follow closely. All right. You can make a lot of money by being a, an assassin. A lot of money. And you matter if right wing or left wing, all right? You go in and you're a hater, radio, cable, in print, whatever, you can get paid. And there's a people who do that. And they go in, they don't even believe half the stuff they say. And they just rip it up. And they get paid a lot of money. And that is coarse into everything. They're phonies. Um, and capitalism drives that. There are people, Americans, who want to hear hate. And they hate it, they hear it. And that has just blown it all up. There are no rules on the internet, none. Go listen to these comments. After this program, I'm sure there'll be chat rooms about this. Where do you see the column? Where do you see them? All right? And that, it's not coming back either. It's not going to get any better. But we have to live with it. Freedom of speech. Scott? Person watching uh, on the internet from Canada, Scott, says, what's wrong with the national sales tax? I like the national sales tax. I got no problem with national sales and, tax. And it, but I target it to Medicare. That's the way to fix that entitlement. You just say, we're going to pay 2%, 1.5%. And you got to lock it down, though. You can't be you know, having to slide and scale up. And all of that money is going to Medicare. Would you means test Social Security? No, because Social Security is basically, right now, can be fixed in the sense that you have to elevate the age that's, you know, you just have to. I mean. It, Life expectancy people now are is 112 older. in Delaware. So people are living more, okay? And uh, you know, if you work out like Jane Fonda, you're in good shape and all that. So you, you raise it, and then if you're wealthy, like Donald Trump and Jon Stewart, you don't really need it, right? So I think we can massage that and get that under control, do the one and a half right. or 2% national sales tax, get the Medicare thing under control, and begin to bring down this horrible debt that is gonna ruin this country. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> would you, here's what I would ask you. Would you take away Grover Northquist's pledge to never raise taxes because that's purely ideological? Wasn't and he it, president twice? But he, listen, dudes, oh, dudes, right, dudes got you know, a ton of 
legislators who have signed a pledge not to raise taxes. If the biggest problem we have in this country is the deficit, why is it that... Uh, look, what are you asking me about Grover Norquist for? Really? He, he's irrelevant? He doesn't uh, have any... Not, uh, I, he's not on my radar screen. I mean, you Oh, because he's got a pledge from, like, No, because he's just a guy. Why don't you ask me about Lenny out there selling bagels? He's just a guy. <laughs> what do I care what he does? Well, he, he seems from, to have quite a hold on the Republican hold, congressional from, delegation. From Missouri, uh, Tristan emails Although Lenny in. might as well, I don't know. <laughs> Depends on the sandwiches. It's good bagels out there. How can you support a presidential candidate when both sides have been proven to misquote, take things out of context, and sometimes blatantly make things up? <gasps> See, Time Magazine's got a great piece this week, a cover story. And uh, they have both campaigns. And they, and they tell you what they said, and, and, and it's all BS. So they all do it, unfortunately. What are you going to do? I mean, you know, like he said, you only got those two guys. So that's what you got. <laughs> what a note of optimism to go out on. <laughs> shit pile number one, shit pile number two. What are you going to do? Mich Michelle from Maryland is in the audience, and she says, would you consider switching jobs for a week? Oh, are you kidding me? I'd have to work in the same building as Colbert? There's no way I'm doing that. <laughs> By the way, we don't work in the same building. Like, Comedy Central's not the real world. We don't, like, share <laughs> a room. But I would love to, you know, I come over and I visit Fox News every now and again, and it's, it's nice because the eye of Mordor is above the building. <laughs> and when you come in, it's kind of funny. Because you go through, and whenever I, I walk through the building, little heads pop there. You know, it's like sort of like that scene in... Indiana Jones, when all those kid miners were working. <laughs> and India, Indiana came through and they all looked up like, Saheed, you know. Uh, but they really have that look in their eyes like, take us with you. I, I, for, I, for one, though, would really like to see Stewart doing the factor, you know, in the beginning of the program when he go, caution, you're about to enter the no spin zone. <laughs> the factor starts right now. <laughs> You know why I would say that is the only way I would do it is, is if somebody kicked me really hard in the nuts. <laughs> Kathleen like from Maryland emails in, what do you respect most about your opponent in this debate? Oh, Kathleen, very new age. <laughs> it's a tough one. Can come up with something? I mean, I would say uh, the man coordinates a mean outfit. <laughs> Tacky. I think that's a beautiful pleat. Thank you. Um, I think you wear, I mean, uh, he's, a, he's a husky man. Listen, I, I appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, a man built like a Yeti can move so fluidly. Uh, I appreciate... Um, he's fixated on the Yeti thing. He, I'm a little it's fixated the fourth on the Yeti time thing. in the last week. In, in all seriousness, I, I feel like uh, Bill comes by his... Uh, his uh, principles, honestly, I think he's a smart guy. I think he's uh, a funny guy. Uh, he's enjoyable to spar with. This idea that uh, disagreeing with somebody, even vehemently, even to the core of your principle, means that you should not engage them is ridiculous. And I have people in my own family who would make this guy look like Castro. So I don't, <laughs> and I love them. So. Uh, I just, I, I find it sort of odd that people even question, how do you talk to that? I, I, I want to jump in here. You know, I, I, I admire someone who's been in rehab six times and still, <laughs> still is as successful as Stuart is. Um, <laughs> Stuart, He's like every guy I ever cut off at a bar. I mean, it's the kind of thing. Stuart tomorrow is going to uh, visit the wounded troops. Sarah from Massachusetts asks, what's the most valuable thing you've learned from hearing the other person's point of view? Let me answer that first. Okay. Now I know I'm right. <laughs> I have learned that Bullshit Mountain is tall. I knew we were going back there. I knew Bullshit that. Mountain is wide. <laughs> And it deep. <laughs> Wrapping it up, uh, Jason from New Jersey asks, if you had one piece of advice for the youth of America, what would it be? 
<laughs> you don't want to get the seeds. What you want to do is... <laughs> you want to get... It's called... The seeds are the swag. <laughs> so, I don't know if they still have LPs, but you open up an LP and you get the shake. And you... <laughs> here's, here's what I would say. <laughs> you know, everybody talks about the entitlement generation. You know, there is no time I would rather live in than now, and there is no generation I would more entrust the future of this country to this one. I've been very impressed with uh, the people that I've met in colleges now. I've been very impressed with young people and their commitment uh, to want to do anything. And there's a tendency to live in a nostalgic state in this country and think that other generations possessed uh, an integrity and a tenacity greater than the generation that is now. And I wholeheartedly disagree with that. And uh, I'm not, I believe that this is a group that will rise up to any challenge uh, that comes before them as well as any other generation uh, in America would have done. So my advice, my advice to them would be, uh, please don't think of me as an entitled moocher when I'm collecting my government benefits. Good. All right. Young pinheads, <laughs> work hard, be honest, get off the net, go outside, travel as much as you can, find your passion. Everybody's good at somebody. <laughs> Everybody's good at something. Everybody's find good at something. what you're good at. Everybody. That's why I believe in God. Everybody has a talent. Find what you're good at and make money doing it. So, usually at the end of these debates, and I'm sure it'll happen on the internet, you know, a winner is picked, a loser is picked, but I think everybody wins this time. Everybody wins. Everybody wins wow. in this one. And... and... Wait, 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 how about a nice hand for Edie Hill for putting up with us? <laughs> and... Better than Jim Lehrer. We have a parting gift. Wow, wow. look at this. For the winners. Nice. Very good. Thank you for coming out, everyone. Thank you for coming out to see us. Thanks a lot. A lot of fun.